I'm just going to give this a couple more minutes. Um, I have a lot of registrants today and people are still still joining. Um, can whoever is unmuted please mute themselves? We're hearing kitchen noise in the background. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'm sure some more people will trickle in. Um, if you haven't noticed, this is being recorded. And I'm going to try to do two things at once. So welcome to the Canadian Society for Organic Urban Land Care, Seoul's national weekly Zoom series called Year of the Ecological Garden. My name is Julia, and I will be hosting today's session. At this time, I'd I'd like to ask everyone to please mute themselves. We meet every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, for about 45 minutes with anyone interested in learning or sharing more about working holistically with the land. We cannot do our work without the support from Guy College, the leading school for organic land care professional development and diploma courses. Seoul's membership includes accredited professionals and certified practitioners. Seoul also welcomes public members who wish to support ecological and holistic land care. If you're currently not a member, please consider joining on our webpage. Every month we feature a theme that impacts our work. This month's theme is, sorry, um, blanking on that. Ecological turf care and turf alternatives. We invite expert guests to talk about the topic and then we open it up to the audience for questions. It is also an opportunity to share best practices. Together we can make more of an impact than we can working on our own. Please note that we record these sessions to make them available on the Seoul website afterwards. You can find upcoming monthly themes and weekly topics there as well. Feel free to share this widely with your network. And if you have a topic you'd like to hear about, please let us know. Before we get started, as a land acknowledgement, I am joining from Ottawa, the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. It would be wonderful to see where all of you are joining us from. And I invite you to do that in the chat box now. Our guest today is Sandora Alfred Purvis. Um, a lifelong gardener, and along with her work for Seoul as the executive director, she runs a Cultivated Art Inc. in Ottawa, Ontario, a small business that includes a native plant micro nursery. Today, she'll be giving a presentation on native species that tolerate foot traffic and mowing as additions or alternatives to conventional turf species. Great. Thank you, Julia. Um, so this turned out to be a very popular topic based on uh, what I saw in registration. So it's obviously something that's coming up more and more for people as uh, we all, a lot of us are making an effort to incorporate more native species into the places we tend. Um, the question of what can go underfoot, um, it keeps coming up. And uh, there's certainly more species than uh, what I've figured out so far, but these are some that uh, I've observed and uh, have most have been able to grow in some spaces that I tend. So I've gotten to know them a little bit. So um, a few things. There we go. Uh, just a couple of things for context notes and expectations. Um, 
a native species lawn will not look like a conventional sort of grass-based turf lawn. They're going to have a different texture. They're going to have a different appearance to them. Um, alternative lawns, um, it's not a matter of substituting one sort of monoculture species for another. Uh, you can have some improvements with going with native species instead of uh, introduced species, but you're still not going to get an ecosystem unless there's a real blend of species. Um, two species that come up very often when people um, ask in various garden groups, including native plant uh, specialty groups, um, that are very often recommended when people start asking for alternatives to turf grass are white clover and creeping thyme. Neither of those are native to this continent. They are introduced here, species from sort of Europe and, and uh, they may extend, extend somewhat into Asia, but primarily European species and they are not uh, North American species. When you're planning all this out, um, do work with your soil type, your regional rainfall conditions, etc. Um, and that is actually where a diverse species lawn gives you better options for adaptation to your conditions than what is available with most of these widely available turf grass blends and species. They, they do vary, but they tend to have a relatively narrow range of preferences. Um, so when you broaden your options, you actually have more opportunities uh, to better adapt to the conditions you're working with instead of having to try to change those conditions. Um, don't expect the same degree of foot traffic tolerance. Um, grass has more lignin than most herbaceous perennial species, so it's more resistant to crushing. Um, stepping stones or other paths might be a good adaptation or addition to your native species turf in the high traffic areas. So there is, there is a difference in amount of foot traffic that they can handle. Um, there's a reason why grass does so well in certain areas. Uh, and finally, native species vary from region to region. Um, I'm in Ontario. I'm also in the Ottawa area, so the traditional um, Anishinaabe Algonquin territory. Um, the, what you will find in different areas will vary. Um, and uh, a lot of ones that I'll show you today do have a very extensive native range, but there will be some variation between uh, Western and Eastern species. So oh, dive right, diving right in. Uh, this one's actually a bit of a personal favorite that I've gotten to know over the last uh, few years um, is lance leaf self heal. So Prunella vulgaris variety, and this is naturally occurring variety, lanceolata. Um, and the reason it's a sub uh, or it's speci specified as a variety, if you look it up, is because there is a European Prunella vulgaris that is actually widely introduced. Um, but like a, a fair number of species actually, we're, we're figuring out that even though there's an introduced strain from Europe, there is actually an indigenous um, a version of lance leaf, of self heal, which is lance leaf self heal. And you can see on the little image in the middle uh, there where I've got the, the orange line um, shows sort of the shape of what the leaf is for the introduced or the European species. And the narrower um, sort of angled in base of the leaf is where you would actually what to look for if you're trying to figure out whether or not the lance leaf or the self heal growing in around your place is the native one or the not native not native one. Um, I really like these because they're hugely adaptable. They are happy in sun. They're happy in quite a bit of shade. Um, they will grow in sandy soil. They will grow in a fairly heavy soil. Um, and they adapt perfectly well to urban conditions and to sort of um, one of the places I garden has very uh, sort of a sandy, gravelly, slightly acidic soil for those of you sort of in the eastern Ontario or, in the, well, lots of Ontario. Um, as you head into certain patches that are on the Canadian Shield Jesus. where you get that gravelly, sandy soil, they just thrive in that. Um, one of these pictures here is actually them growing up the middle of my rural driveway um, and being perfectly happy with absolutely no assistance whatsoever. So one thing you'll notice with some of these pictures that I'm showing you is a lot of the plants are taller and that's not because they won't tolerate mowing, it's because most of the places I work with, I 
don't do very much in the way of mowing. Um, so they're allowed to grow to sort of, these will actually grow as high as about 18 inches. But um, because I don't have a lot of photos of these plants in their mowed condition, because in my spaces, they're often not heavily mowed. Um, they're just trimmed back a couple of times a year, often with head shears, because the spaces are small enough that I can do that. Um, so going to Google for some examples. Um, and you can see that they actually form very dense patches and they can be kept quite low. They're very tolerant of mowing. Is especially if the mowing starts sort of first thing in the growing season, and they can easily stay sort of two or three inches tall and uh, bloom very abundantly in the springtime, but they will also uh, actually rebloom through the summer, especially sort of uh, two or three weeks after a, a good rainfall. If it's been dry, they'll actually come back into a bloom state. And they're actually very popular pollinators. Uh, I didn't include the picture, but I actually have pictures of the little small, the, the uh, shiny green bees. They'll clean, climb right inside of those flowers and uh, uh, collect the, the pollen and nectar. And these have a very extensive range. So this is a map from Vascan, the Vascular Plants Canada database. So they um, are native through all of the provinces um, and they're introduced or not growing within some of the territories. So uh, pretty coast to coast, but not coast to coast to coast. <laughs> um, Blue violet. This is another example of a species that often occurs in lawns and you can often Google and find that they are most of the results about violets in the lawns would be how do I kill the violets in my lawn. Um, I take very much the approach of okay how can I get more violet, violets growing in my lawn. Um, these will grow in sun but where they really uh, seem to sort of really uh, hit their stride is in part shade and they will tolerate quite a bit of shade. Um, so a lot of times when people are actually complaining about them in their lawns, it's actually areas that are too shady for the grass to thrive and these have filled in in their space. So again, a species that is perfectly tolerant of mowing and will adapt to growing sort of at that three inch height and will actually bloom quite abundantly at that height. Um, quite adaptable for soil type, will tolerate being walked on. Um, if you don't trim them, they can get easily sort of 12 to even if they're competing for height with other plants around them as much as 18 inches tall. Um, so a lot of these plants, you know, this wasn't just no maintenance turf, this was mowing and foot traffic tolerant species. So again, um, mowing tolerant, a slightly less foot traffic tolerant than the prunella. I find that those actually, um, they even encroach on the tire tracks of the car over the course of the summer. <laughs> so they will actually handle quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of physical sort of crushing abuse. Um, the violets, they, they tolerate sort of moderate foot traffic, regular mowing, no problem, um, but their rhizomes are right at the surface. So they wouldn't necessarily tolerate constant sort of main pathway locations. Um, but otherwise, very, very tough, very low maintenance and very showy in the springtime. Um, and if you if your violets aren't fragrant, if you have some growing, if they're not fragrant, they're probably the native ones because the only um, sort of widely distributed introduced violet is the violet, viola odorata. Um, and they're quite fragrant. That's sweet violet and that's from Europe. And then the rest of them are generally going to be native North American species. And this one's very widespread, as you can see from the map. So the only province, uh, well, they grow in Newfoundland, but not necessarily Labrador. Um, but I know we often count that as one province. <laughs> and, uh, and they're not considered native in Alberta, but they're still a very, very widespread species. And as you can see, they can stay quite low. And they do often occur in some of the same areas that moss will naturally occur. Um, again, that's because they're far more shade tolerant than the typical um, lawn grass, the, the turf grass lawns. 
This is another one that um, I actually, I don't see it that much growing wild in this area, but it's a very widely distributed. And um, I, I'm actually been, I've been adding them to some of the sunnier, drier spots in my gardens, especially in amongst other species where I'm looking for um, someone to sort of really cover that ground layer in between a taller species. Um, but they also adapt perfectly well to lawn settings. Um, and it's they're called silverweed for a reason. They are quite distinctly silvery in their foliage, and it's very soft to the touch. And uh, they have uh, these pretty sort of little yellow flowers, and they are a member of the Potentilla family. Um, so that's the same sort of flower form you tend to see with the, the Potentilla family. Um, while they do actually like moist settings, they are ex extremely drought and heat tolerant. So they are a species I would try in spots where grass might not be thriving because it's too dry or it's just dry grass or dry area that you want to get rid of the grass. And this is one of the species that could actually make a nice tapestry. These ones spread by uh, runners, um, so stolons across the surface, much like strawberries do. So you can actually sort of direct them to where you want them to go as they put out runners. You can sort of weigh them down with a little rock or pin them down and actually help train them to fill in a nice patch, um, especially if you sort of have a, um, like a boulevard planting or something like that, where you need a species that will by its nature stay quite short. So I haven't seen go above the, the tallest, maybe 10 inches without any pruning. But as you can see, they will actually form quite a dense mat with pruning. And uh, these are ones that um, you can find a, quite a few uh, pages on online where people are talking about how do you eliminate silverweed from your lawn and I always consider that to be a pretty good hint that this is a good species to consider as a lawn alternative because if they're out competing the lawn then that's a good sign that uh, they will adapt well to being a lawn in themselves and as you can see they can be found everywhere in Canada they are extremely widespread and they're actually circumboreal so they can be found in Europe as well. Well, wild strawberry. Now, this is a species that um, I would say would probably be best mixed with, and it doesn't have to be grass, although it's very often found in mowed lawn areas, um, but probably would mix with other species as opposed to being just uh, strawberry ground cover, but they can form quite a dense patch. Um, and these do have an edible berry. They're really flavorful. Like actually, I would say it's like you have just as much flavor as in a, with a full of uh, the large sort of commercial strawberries, um, but just in a smaller package. So same amount of flavor, concentrated. Um, very appealing to a lot of pollinators in the springtime. Um, you'll get lots of flowers on them. They'll, in an open area left to their own devices, they don't generally get more than about six inches tall. If they're competing for light, taller species, they can get up to around eight inches or eight or 12 inches tall. Um, and they spread again by stolons across the surface of the ground um, and they root where they touch. And in a rich setting, they can, they can make a very dense patch, but they will actually tolerate the, I, I stopped and took these photos that are roadside um, patch in very poor soil conditions. And uh, I was actually stopping to photograph another species that, that we'll see in a moment. Um, and the strawberries were just uh, blooming their little hearts out in this really poor quality, low nutrient soil um, and they seem to be relatively salt resistant as well so they could be another good boulevard species um, and best in um, thickest in full sun but actually fairly tolerant of part shade as well so you can actually um, you'll you'll get fewer flowers but if you're mostly going for dense foliage they do actually do quite well in part shade and there is a woodland strawberry that is native which is even more shade tolerant so um, again options for spaces where I know lawns traditionally struggle these are low growing ground covers that are native and are more adaptable to to growing conditions as they are rather than being upset that that's not the growing condition that i wanted um, so again another google search image to show sort of how they would tend to appear in a lawn and they can get quite dense um, but when they're mowed regularly i do find they're a little bit more open so are usually best um, as a mixed species turf 
um, but as a, as a ground cover that's allowed to grow taller, they can actually form a very dense patch of, of leaves and foliage. So if you're okay with sort of six or eight inches and not as much walking, then they can actually make a nice ground cover. And they also can form a good ground cover layer in, um, in perennial ecosystems. So if you're trying to fill in that layer that we often mulch, ground um, strawberries can actually uh, fill that mulch role by keeping the ground covered and protected rather than using um, a material you're regularly bringing in and replacing and as you can see from the Basken range map they grow everywhere <laughs> in this country um, so extremely widely distributed so if you have a spot that's extremely well drained, um, that likes to go toasty and crunchy in the summertime, this is definitely a species to check out. So they, they don't like soggy spots. They thrive in dry conditions, um, conditions that often uh, grass does not thrive in. And in those settings, uh, I see them form really large, dense colonies um, and they have this Um, the foliage um, certainly starts quite green in the spring, but even then it's got a little bit of a silvery tone to it. And then when the heat hits during the summer, uh, that silver becomes a lot more apparent. So they're definitely a very silvery tone in the foliage. And the, the leaves, even unmowed, don't generally exceed more than, than about two inches in height. Um, excuse me. But, uh, and the flowers, which appear actually, these photos were taken a couple of weeks ago, possibly almost three weeks ago now, here in the Ottawa area. So quite early blooming. And the stems come up um, six, maybe as much as eight inches, but generally about six inches high. Um, so they're, they're much easier to spot this time of year than, than they are later, but they can form very dense patches uh, when they're happy and when they're, especially when they're in dry areas. And you can see an example of that. Um, anybody who's been sort of camping in on Canadian Shield areas where there's sort of lawns that are mowed for camping purposes, but they don't worry too much about keeping the, the, the grass itself dense. And it's often on sort of that acidic, gravelly, sandy soil. And these just thrive. They're perfectly adapted to that. Um, and again, quite widely distributed across the country. This one is actually one of the um, most adapted to lawn condition species, uh, sort of our conventional turf lawns, and also extremely tra foot traffic tolerant. Um, it's Achelia. Now, there's the tricky thing with these ones is finding a source for the boreal yarrow, um, the Achelia borealis, as opposed to the um, the million the milliformis, um, which is the European. And there, there used to be the borealis used to be considered a subspecies of Achelia millifolium, the million because the millifolium because they have so many tiny little leaflets, um, so sort of like the million leaf. Um, but the last few years, I'm not exactly sure the exact date, they, they classified them as their own species and native throughout Canada. So really widely distributed. Um, for a long time, there was uh, a lot of older books will say that yarrow was an introduced species to this continent. And that has been corrected. Yarrow has been here all along. But because we've been widely introducing the European uh, species, finding the Achelia borealis. And I'll be honest, I have yet to find a really good way to tell them apart. And you can find notes about that on some native species sites where they're like, we're not selling these because we can't find a reliable seed source. Um, but there is native yarrow. They are extremely tall. They are almost indistinguishable from the European yarrow to those of us who haven't found it. Some, some key to figure out the difference between, um, but extremely drought tolerant, extremely heat tolerant, um, extremely mowing tolerant and very foot traffic tolerant. 
not terribly happy in a lot of shade. That's sort of their um, the, the one thing they don't like. And these are very much a, if you want them as a lawn look, mow them because if they are not mowed, they grow easily a couple of feet tall and have white clusters of flowers on the top. So quite a different texture from when they're mowed. And when they're mowed, they look very much like tiny little fern foliage um, in the lawn. And they're quite soft, um, very soft underfoot. And as I said, extremely foot traffic tall. And uh, they do blend well with other species also, although when happy in a sunny, dry spot, they can form extremely dense patches, um, so you don't have to blend them with other species from a functional standpoint. Well, from an ecological standpoint, I still recommend multi-species uh, areas. There's a few here. Um, the last few I'll cover are ones that are honorable mentions, or the last couple. This is one um, time leaved speedwell. So Verona, it's a Veronica. Um, and uh, this is where getting down to sort of learning, you know, looking up all the weeds <laughs> and come up in the garden. Um, these ones are native and there's a fuzzy leafed one that's quite similar and has a slightly deeper blue flower, which is European. So sorting these, and they both pop up in a lot of the similar areas. But this is a species that was popping up quite a bit in my vegetable garden beds. And uh, what I did last year is uh, in the fall, I went around and I collected them because I intentionally left them. And I put them all together um, to make a bit of a path. And I added some stepping stones because while these naturally stay quite low, the foliage only gets like an inch tall and the flowers mostly around three inches you'll get the occasional spike that might be like four inches tall so very low growing um excellent um filler species between stepping stones and and for sort of only occasionally walked on areas um so not necessarily highly foot traffic tolerant but perfectly tolerant of mowing and also a really excellent op, um, alternative to creeping time for stepping for filling in stepping stone paths. So that's a species that can sort of fill that role we've been relying on a European species for. Um, I've had them come up and do well in sun and in shade and also they're coming up in the my urban garden which tends to have a much heavier soil and in the rural garden where it's a very sandy loam with almost zero clay and very little capacity to hold nutrients and they seem to be doing very well in both areas so quite adaptable for soil types. Um, and uh, in the in the urban garden, they've been coming up in shady areas, and in the rural garden, they came up in more sunny areas. So I think it was more a matter of where the space is. Um, that's where they showed up, and I've just been sort of rearranging them to to locations where there was a space where they could stay long term. Um, so nice, really low growing, easy ground cover for between stepping stones and so forth. Um, I'm mentioning this one, not necessarily because I think people will make a, a lawn out of it, but because these do occur in lawns and there's also a European species, um, the common plantain that also occurs in lawns. And I just like to mention this because like with the yarrow and the prunella and the violets, there's often assumptions that these are European species, these lawn weeds. Are, are introduced when very often there are introduced ones and there are native ones. Um, and to not overlook the value of, of maintaining some of the native ones. So this is Rugel's plantain. Um, this is a native species. Um, they are very similar in appearance to the common plantain. Um, they have a little bit more red at the base of it. And if you sort of do an online search, they can talk, they talk about sort of the, the shape of the seed pod and, and some, some fine distinctions. Um, and that's a naturally occurring species. So not, not one that was introduced through settlement. They've been here all along and they have partnerships with the local ecosystem. And they're also very tolerant of anything from foot traffic to car traffic, I know, because they pop up in my rural driveway. Um, so they, they don't particularly like being driven over by the car, but they survive it so they can handle quite a bit of foot traffic. Um, so a few notes. Many of these Somebody's uh, Paula, you're getting, I'm 
getting feedback or something. Um, so uh, since many of these are, are often classified as weeds, and that's actually how I tracked a lot of these down, was to look at who's already growing on the lawn or popping up in the garden and trying to find out who they were and where they came from. Um, but because they're often classified as weeds, they can be a bit difficult to source. If you're like, okay, I love that. Can I go to the garden center and get it? Probably not. Um, but the more we ask for them, the easier they will become to find. Um, and right now, plant swaps, um, garden groups, they can be good places to ask. Um, and certainly sort of your local social media, whether Facebook or what have you, um, gardening group. If you tell people that you want the weeds out of their lawn and you're specific which ones you want, and hey, if you're willing to come over and dig them out, a lot of people are like, please take them. Um, so, you know, it can be a nice, uh, a nice way for you to start to gather some of the introduced species. Um, Ecoturf grass is seed blends. Um, I have seen various ones promoted and again, often in spaces where people are asking about native species and then Ecoturf blends are being recommended. Um, all of the ones I've looked at so far were able to get an actual species list for them and start looking them up and they're all Eurasian species. So um, there are likely some native grass species that can adapt to sort of lawn and turf areas, um, but I'm just at the start of learning about the less commonly cultivated grasses. So the, there are certain native species grasses that are quite popular and easy to source and easy to identify, but there's actually a lot of native grass species that I'm not that familiar with and starting to just, just starting to untangle which are which. Um, and you'd be surprised just how many Vivian the taller grasses yeah, that you might see in an area, especially in Ontario in the area where I live. Most of them are actually Eurasian grass species, even the taller ones. Um, and the other challenge is finding seed sources yeah, for species for some of the lower growing grasses. Uh, I might know these exist, but finding them <laughs> is not always easy. Um, keep in mind that species vary from one region to another. Um, and so to develop a list of what might be appropriate for, for your area, you can do the same thing I did. Look at the species already growing in mixed turf areas, so the weeds, um, as well as any low growing volunteers in the garden and start looking up where are they from. Um, Many of them, especially in our urban spaces, will be introduced species, um, but some are likely to be from the continent or even from your home region. So starting to um, starting to sort out who's who and where did you come from and what's your ecological role, and then that can give you some really good guidance on maybe which ones to keep weeding and which ones to start re re relocating to appropriate spaces in your in your home landscape. Um, a blend of Eurasian turf grass species, and, and you know, I, I, I keep calling them the Eurasian. Um, keep in mind, Kentucky bluegrass is not only not blue, it's not from Kentucky. Kentucky bluegrass is a European species. Um, but blending some of those with native perennials may be a reasonable adaptation for some of the high traffic spaces. Um, so just keeping, you know, starting with whatever grass you have. If you're working on converting a whole lawn area, it might just be a matter of keeping, just keep adding um, native species to that. Um, rather than necessarily worrying about removing everything and then just introducing native species and trying to keep all the grass weeded out. That might be feasible for your space and if it is lovely, um, but if it isn't, just continuing to introduce native species uh, can improve the biodiversity in your turf area and the capacity for that turf area to support more biodiversity of insect, uh, insect life. Um, so all the pollinators that uh, we're, we're hoping to take better care of. Um, and I would also say to only place turf of any type, whether native or not, where there's a functional need for it. Um, even a mixed native species turf will host less diversity than a native garden where species of varying heights and textures can coexist. Um, I have some open areas in my yard where, 
I might only trim things down in the areas that I know I need to walk on. And then it might be sort of turf-ish, um, but allowed to grow taller in some of the other spots so that if I have people coming over or I know I'm gonna have something going on, you know, a few weeks ahead of time, I'll start trimming them down shorter, but they're often allowed to be a bit taller. Um, but even still, it's, it's still the more we can, allow space to include a diversity of heights and textures and bloom times and bloom shapes and that the more diversity the space will be able to support. So turf where there is a specific reason for it, where sight lines are important, where there's play area or paths of travel, things like that. And then if it doesn't need to be turf, great, let's have some more diversity. Um, just a few thing, quick things here. I'm going to paste these into the chat. So if you're looking any of these up, and I have not been following the chat, so I'll, I'll come back to that one. Again. So this is the plant list of what I just uh, went through, and you can copy that out of the chat um, in case you're madly writing any of these down as I'm talking and you're trying to not sit. Um, sources and resources, so some of the, the resources that I've used in putting this together. Um, and also some other resources that I've put together over time. Again, I'm pasting this into the chat. Um, so the range map images were from Bascan. Um, that's those little maps that I showed. Bascan is a wonderful resource for looking up um, what the range of species um, is that, uh, that are growing outside of cultivation. And depending on the color coding on the map, whether they're introduced species or whether they're, they're considered indigenous to the region. Um, the photos in this presentation, they were either from my own collection or as we saw those screenshots of Google image results. Um, I made a native plant library, it's sort of photos and profiles of 90 plant species that I posted over the winter to Facebook. You don't have to have a Facebook account to access it. Um, and, uh, but you can see the different species that I, um, I, I've compiled a lot of photos and a lot of descriptions um, that to help show more of, of what is possible in, in a garden when you're trying to grow native uh, to Ontario species. And um, I also do have a native plant store page and I'm not doing this to plug sales. Um, I've assembled it in such a way to, that I've made some lists of species by ecosystem type or other traits. So when you're trying to pick out plants for an area you're working with, um, I'm hoping that for the vast majority of the year when the native plant store is not open to orders, uh, it can actually function as a planning uh, uh, and resource for when you're working on your garden spaces and you're going, what are my growing conditions? What species are appropriate for those spaces? And finally, um, just a quick plug for the upcoming uh, episodes in this series. The whole month is going to be about turf um, in one way or another. So organic maintenance of existing turf, turf grass species and cultural management practices, including biological management. And then um, for those who are like, no, I don't want turf at all, um, some wildscaping design as, as lawn alternatives. So when you're changing out that whole front yard and something else, you'll see some lovely examples of it in there. And then this is all, uh, these are all things you can sign up for through Eventbrite. And let me just paste that in here. And then we can go to questions. All right. There was one question here. Um, Near the beginning, I'm just going to scroll through the chat to find it. Um, curious to know which of these are safe to grow about a septic bed, maybe oh, above actually, a septic bed. Any of them. Um, they have a similar sort of root structure in that as turf grass would. And if you went and you looked around on your septic bed, it, uh, it's entirely possible that some of them are already growing there. So yeah, any of the above. Um, and oh, I see there's a question. Uh, do I have any thoughts or info to share on moss? Moss is an extremely diverse um, family of plants um, as far as number of species. And the correct one for the growing conditions you're working with will likely show up on their own, sort of like how fungus shows up <laughs> um, on their own. 
and um, you know, it, it, moss also blows around from spores. So if you have moss, um, carry on. The milkshake thing doesn't work. There's been research on that. Everybody loves to show before and after photos and they're almost always faked or they were just lucky enough that it was a space that was gonna actually grow moss, but the milkshake thing makes a great little website video so people keep sharing them. Um, so moss, the correct moss tends to show up. Um, and so you can help thrive by removing competition or anything that smother, would smother them, but moss is, is closer to like fungus and behavior than it is a plant. Um, so try not to dig them up and move them around. They won't necessarily thrive. Um, am I my back? Okay, so quack grass. Um, I'm just refreshing my memory here for a moment. I don't know why my computer's... Oh, I know. Um, I always swap quack grass. Okay, so... Are you mowing it would be, um, if you're regularly mowing it, crap, uh, uh, um, quack grass. Crap, crap, I'm, cra I'm cl crossing the names. <laughs> she also has creeping Charlie, which makes it yeah. tricky. <laughs> um, quack grass is, is, if you are regularly mowing it, I would tend to say most of these will actually, I wouldn't say they will overwhelm it, but they would coexist with. Um, and they would let they wouldn't be terribly likely to get overwhelmed, um, except for that that little Veronica. That one is quite small um, and doesn't handle as much um, competition. So I would tend to say, go for it. Um, Creeping Charlie actually that's Creeping Charlie is the background species in my yard in my backyard. It's um, and uh, so far the the Prunella is doing well. The I tried. Um, the field pussy toes they actually really like it dry 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 and my yard is not dry enough for them um but the prunella is doing well and um wild strawberries are doing well um so those those have taken quite nicely to the space um toxicity somebody's asking me they asked me through a direct message but they probably meant to um probably meant it to be a general one um any issues with toxicity not that I'm aware of. I know violets, are, and again, I know these are edible for humans. So sometimes there's difference between uh, diff pets and, and, and humans. But uh, the uh, even creeping Charlie is edible. I, I found it. It's quite good in potato salad. Um, but violets are edible. Um, the prunella is is actually um, a medicinal species. That's uh, that it, I am. Um, I have not heard any toxicity. It's one of those mild medicinal species. Um, the plantain is medicinal. Um, I'm just looking at my list again, trying to think if there was anything else. Um, the yarrow should be fine. I know it's fine for humans. Silverweed is completely edible. Um, so in general, I would say you probably are just as likely to have toxic plants in your lawn anyway. <laughs> um, so, Yes, the which of the species discussed is the most behaved in terms of not spreading into neighbors' yards. As soon as those neighbors keep their turf grass from spreading into my yard, I'll have that conversation. <laughs> um, that's one of those things where people like you have to keep your area under control. But my yeah. my introduced species can spread wherever it wants to. Um, most of these are surface spreading species. The, the one that would probably most effectively spread into your neighbor's yard would be the blue violet the, or the, um, because they seed very quickly. Um, the rest of them, I would not put them beyond their turf grass as far as spreadability. They're no worse than turf grass and that spreads from their yard into yours. Um, choked out by the... Uh, <laughs> Would any of these not be choked out by the goatweed? All of these are short and goatweed is tall. And I tend to do things by height um, as far as, I don't worry about strawberries choking out my perennial garden when I use them as a living mulch because the perennials are all taller. All of these are much shorter than the goatweed. Um, it's not gonna fix goatweed. You're gonna need bigger plants than goatweed to choke out goatweed. <laughs> But I think we're running out of time. Um, 
Uh, how are these species, species with foot with traffic? Foot traffic? So all of the ones, the only one that I would say is not, is it's still moderately tolerant, but not extremely tolerant of foot traffic would be the, um, and they might prove to be, but I think they're too delicate, is the Veronica, that little last low growing one. All the rest of them, these are species that adapt very well to lawn conditions. Um, I wouldn't put them as being more tolerant than grass, but they're, they can still make a good turf species. And again, mix them all together. Um, that would be my suggestion as well, because different ones will thrive in slightly different areas. But there's some of these will thrive in drier conditions than your long grass, some of these will thrive in shadier conditions than your long grass, and all of them will coexist with long grass if you're trying to do more of a mixed turf. Um, and if you have all that diversity, your shady areas of your lawn are going to be full and green, your, your sunny areas of your lawn are going to be full and green, everything's going to be nice and full and green. So isn't that the whole goal anyway? Um, I think we're hitting time. Oops. So any final questions? None coming in. Um, you can always reach out to us via Facebook or email. Um, Sonora, what's your sole email? Executive Director at OrganicLandCare.ca? Yes, that's the one. There we go. Um, there might even be an info at OrganicLandCare.ca that I think I forget. <laughs> um, oh, your Prunella vulgaris Lancelot is sold out. So. Ah. People but are if I have some site. spare time this week, I'll <laughs> pop more up and it'll come back in stock because I have seedlings. They're just not in plug trays. So you can check out her um, her store and see what you can find there. Um, so this recording will be sent out and will be available on the website shortly. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today and happy growing season. Bye.